that the, the one thing that I think I took away from this more than anything is it gave me a lot more patience mm-hmm. because it is a lot of waiting. Mm-hmm. You get to a room and you wait, and then you get called to another room and you wait, and then you get this test and you wait. So um, a lot of waiting. The first day was just a lot of unknown, and um, it was it was interesting. You know, it was just it was a lot to take in and absorb and um, process. But the the people at Cabrini were so amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, it was it was really it was fun. You know, I mean, we'd go and we'd laugh and <laughs> joke and. Oh, really? I mean, it's, it really was. It really was. You know. Angela actually put on um, my blog whenever I had a photo because anyone that would take me to chemotherapy, because at, towards the end of when I was going every week to Alexandria, it was hard for Alan to take off work. So I would have friends and family that would take me down. And Angela posted, she's like, Who knew chemotherapy could be so much fun? I'm like, Who knew? Not I. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th- those nurses and everyone there, just they're, they're special people, you yes. know, to be able to take such a terrible thing and, and make it fun and lighthearted oh, and okay. let you laugh and um, <laughs> so you know that was that was it was just a new experience yeah. a new journey Anson you want to say something what do you want to say do you love mommy yeah <laughs> do you love your snack mm. mm-hmm. <laughs> I think I got more enjoyment out of that than Aaron said if he loves me or not <laughs> okay so we'll go to Michael next Okay. <laughs> okay, so my question for you is after chemo was in progress and Yana started her new look, how did that affect you? <laughs> um, Don't I, you bring up Stella. <laughs> you not bring up Stella. She would always be patting Stella in the office. <laughs> um, no, um, I would say that's where it really hit me, um, that it was real, because I don't think you realize how real it is until someone loses their hair. Mm-hmm. Um, so it definitely hit me. Um, but she really didn't let that affect her at all. Um, she rocked her wig and she rocked her hats. Um, but it was that moment to where, like, I've always, since I'm the director of Up Till Dawn and she's the advisor for Up Till Dawn, I've always looked at childhood cancer and I've never ventured off of childhood cancer. So it definitely brought to light breast cancer um, and it definitely heightened my awareness. But it was, that was when it hit me that it was real. Okay, so Natalie, the next question is, like, with her new look and everything, do you feel that she was self-conscious around, like, friends, family, students? Really not at all. I mean, I think Yana embraced everything as it came. Um, she embraced um, the news um, better than I would have embraced it. She, she, you know, I just look at Yana in terms of how she embraced everything, and it was this can-do, I'm going to do it, I'm going to conquer it, I'm going to take it on attitude. And... Um, you know, even talking about her wig, Stella, you've already talked about Stella, we're talking about her wig. Um, you know, Stella didn't make a whole lot of appearances because Mm -hmm. it was like, Stella came out for a little while and she was like, you know what, forget it. And, and it was like, let's just rock, let's just rock what's happening, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and she really embraced that. And I think that, um, that speaks volumes about who she is as a person and, and in terms of just, um, really having fun with the, with her hats and, um, and just embracing all of it as it came. Um, so I never saw her be self-conscious. Mm-hmm. I, she was um, phenomenal. Do you feel like you were self-conscious? Like, Oh, see, mm. <laughs> at the very beginning, when I started getting, like the hair started falling out, and, um, and you guys obviously you probably did not see it, oh, Alan, poor thing, did. Um, but it was pretty much, the only way I can describe it, and I don't want to offend anyone, but it was kind of like I had mange. <laughs> like it was just like spots that would just kind of show up and then go away. I mean, it was just a hot mess. So I was like, ooh, no, mm-mm. My head was my head was very tender, also with the hair falling out. Um, one of the the way I can describe the process of the hair falling out for the first time was, um, and the women in the room or men with long hair can definitely um, relate to this. When you have your hair back in a ponytail and your head gets sore from that feeling of being back in a ponytail or having a headband, think of that. But the entire head feel that same way. Um, every f- strand of hair was aching, if you will. And I know they're dead in a sense, but it was, that's probably the best way that I can describe it. It was just, mm-hmm. my head was sore. So trying to wear Stella, who, very pretty, I might add, it was very much the same haircut, like of that Natalie's actually sporting today. She's not wearing Stella. Yeah. <laughs> um, it just was very tender, my head was very tender. So I was like, you know, 
I mean, I never really once cared about my hair. It was just, it was there. It just You had to do it because you just had to do it. So I, I embraced the whole part of it because I'm like, I don't have to do my hair. Like, this is <laughs> awesome. And again, it, it was just one of those things. Like, you, you know, when life hands you lemons, you make pink lemonade. And that's what we do. Okay. So my next question is for Alan. Um, how did you stay so supportive in this process without being too concern to worry like how do you stay so supportive yeah um you know i mean being a guy you know i think guys are mostly geared to fix a problem you know and uh so it was a lot of you know there was a lot of times i was wondering you know what what can we do let's let's mm -hmm. do it let's do it let's go let's go let's go you know i was always like you know go to the doctor do this let's you know just i always wanted to get it done and uh you know they, that was that was tough just not being, like you said, being overbearing, or just sometimes when she just wanted to talk, she didn't want me to fix it, you know? And uh, that was tough, but... Um, One I thing just, that he did do, and I, which I was very, very appreciative, was pink socks. Pink socks. Um, he wore pink socks. He actually wore them today, in honor of today. Um, but he wore pink socks um, the day, or practically as soon as yeah. I got diagnosed, you ordered those. I ordered them, yeah. He ordered the pink socks, and he wore pink socks every day of me through treatment until just a couple of weeks ago when I finished with radiation. Poor little thing, like <laughs> out there on the tennis court or going running, and he's got these pink socks. <laughs> and all the guys, which was pretty interesting, though, because it was just a small statement, but we knew it was a big statement for mm -hmm. us. And and it was just a small thing, like, guys, we ripping on him. Like, why are you wearing pink socks? And he wouldn't say anything. Like, I'm just like, why don't you defend it? Like, why aren't you telling anyone? And he goes, because the moment they say it, the moment they realize that it was for me. And that, to me, was probably the, the mm -hmm. sweetest thing that someone can do is, it's a small gesture, but it was, it, it spoke volumes of the love and support that he gave throughout. And, and one other thing that, and I'm, I'm gonna brag on you too, but um, I don't have it today, <clears throat> but it's okay. Um, is he it's did, fault. yeah, it's his <laughs> fault. Um, love him, but um, he created um, this wonderful box, and we call it the, the hope box, or love box, or hope box. And um, friends and family and, and people that I didn't even know wrote in to Alan secretly and to Angela and to whomever else, and I think Jennifer, one of my good friends as well, just wrote in all these special notes of encouragement or letters or, or poems or quotes or whatever it may be. And, um, and Alan printed everything out and put it in this box. And I don't know how many we received. It's about 850. About 850 right. notes of for people that, and there are people that I didn't even know. Mm -hmm. It was one that I ended up reading was, you know, you don't know who I am, but I saw your post on Facebook from a friend, like a, like a, a friend of, of yours. And I just felt the need to tell you something and to, to, share you, to share this with you. And he did that for me so whenever I was possibly feeling a little tired or bummed out or whatever it may be, um, that I can read through these notes. And I'm gonna be honest, like at the very beginning, I got it for Christmas time. Um, I started reading through because I was just curious of what people had to say and mm -hmm. you never know, because it is a tough time and being around the holiday time, you know, it, it, it's, you know, kind of emotional. And, um, but I never really, looked in the box come January during treatment. Like it was, it was one of those things that I knew that it was there um, and I read throughout the majority of them, but knowing that the box was there was enough for me and I didn't really need to have those pick-me-ups because I got it every time I turned around and every time I, I walked into a room, I, I got those positive encouragements and, and, and it really, I was very blessed that I didn't have to have a, it wasn't a bad experience for me. Um, and, and I know that there's many people out there that do. And, 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 and every day you have a choice. And I was lucky enough that my body took to the treatment very well. And, um, and, I, and I say that a lot to me being, being healthy, but the doctors knew me and knew what needed to happen for me. So that was something that when he did that for me, I was very, very blessed and, and I appreciated every note, everything that I did read in there. And But I was kind of happy that I didn't have to go into that box as often as I thought I would at the very beginning. Okay. And that was one of the, that was kind of one of the ways that I um, was able to just, that was my way of fixing it for me. You know, it took my mind off of things and, um, I felt like I was doing something, you know, because so much of it, that's what's so amazing about, you know, you hear early detection, early detection, early detection. 
Well, we detected it. I mean, the the first last week of November, first week of December, maybe. You know, and she didn't have surgery until the in middle December. of January. Yeah. Oh, I'm in sorry. December. Yeah, that's right. The end of December, and then we the treatment was in January. So it was very much like me. I was like, when they found it, I was like, starting chemo tomorrow, right? You know, kind of thing. And uh, you know, it's just so that was that was kind of my way of you know being able to put my energy into something to try to take my mind off of it and you know help out as okay. much as I could since I'm not a doctor. <laughs> okay, um, my next question is. Once chemo was like underway, what do you feel that was your strongest emotion and then how did you display it to your family, to your friends, and to your students? Um, I would say that the strongest emotion that I had with chemotherapy, um, which I know this might sound strange, but you know me um, and it probably won't, um, was relief. Um, I was doing something. There was something that I knew every two weeks, it was clockwork. I'm going in there and I'm fighting cancer. And I'm going in there and I'm meeting new, new friends along the way. And of course, me being that social butterfly, I, I don't mind it. But it was one of those things that it was relief to know that I was in good hands. And the research that has, has happened over the years to get to the point where we are intrigues me. And, and it really was kind of like, all right, we're getting somewhere, we're doing something. As opposed to just kind of sitting around being like, okay, I've just had the surgery now I had the port put in you know what do we do now and just kind of waiting around and um, and I actually had to make the decision when to start chemotherapy and I was like okay when we're gonna start they said you can start this last week of January and my birthday is February 1st and they said you know you can start it on the Wednesday I said oh no we're not I am not starting chemotherapy on my birthday like who wants that like happy birthday to me no thanks so <laughs> I was like no we're gonna do this we're gonna do it the day before so we did it on January 31st but again it was that whole process of thank goodness we're doing something because like Alan said it was kind of waiting and waiting and waiting although from what I've heard with all my other friends who's gone through this that usually it is a long wait before you can actually get from surgery to treatment but I was we had a pretty quick process I mean it was a quick turnaround but when you're in the middle of it it feels like it's forever Okay, so since Amson made his appearance earlier, yeah, um, how, like I know he's so young, so of course he had no idea what was going on. But like, how did he react to like your haircut or like just simple changes? You know, okay, so we try to, you know, we try to teach him a lot, a lot at, at age two, um, and it doesn't really genius. work. Yeah, he's a genius, and um, and so we we kind of like he really hates to get his hair cut, hates it. I think we might have scarred him for life, actually, with his first haircut. So it's very hard for us to get to cut his hair. As you could probably notice, it's pretty shaggy. It's really, it's like pulling teeth to cut his hair. And so we use the opportunity as a learning process for him. Like, look, AC, mommy's in the, in the bathroom getting her hair cut. Because <laughs> after I got my hair trimmed um, with one of my good friends, the next day it was just coming out in just handfuls. So I, I'd ask Alan, I was like, can you just please shave it? Just please go for it. And I do his hair all the time. So I was like, I know he probably loved the fact that he got to do mine. Um, and so we're sitting in the bathtub and I'm sitting on this stool and here comes Amzen running in and he's like, what are you doing? And I said, well, mommy's getting a haircut because that's what he calls it. And he was like, oh, okay. And he walked out. And I was like, no, 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 AC, do you want to get a haircut too? And he goes, uh-uh, mm -mm, no, no. <laughs> okay. And I'm like, no, 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 AC. And we tried and we, we tried everything. Wouldn't he wouldn't have it. So he, he could care less. He's like, as, as long as you're getting the haircut and I'm not, we're cool. It's pretty much his demeanor. <laughs> okay, so um, Angela, what do you feel was your biggest challenge as her best friend? To say that I had any challenges would really be a misstatement um, mm -hmm. because as helpless as we feel and as much as we want to help, um, when I heard the news, I cried, I was devastated, I asked why, I was angry. Don't be angry. <laughs> I'm not anymore. <laughs> but, um, you know, I just couldn't understand the, the meaning behind it all. And um, so for me to say that I had any challenges would really just be, I, I can't say that there were. Um, I would, 
Yana it was, is always very, very busy. I am too. We used to be able to talk to each other every single day when we worked together. And uh, now that no, I no longer work in her department, um, we don't see each other as often as we would like to. And I feel like because of this experience, we actually carved out times to spend time together a little bit more. We were in constant communication with some of the stuff that we were putting together and mm -hmm. bracelets we were designing and um, distractions we were creating um, during that time. Um, but I cannot say that I had any hard part in it at all because I think from the outside we want to fix it and we want to change it and we want to help and that is frustrating but to compare anything that I was going through to what she was going through it, I just can't do that. Okay. Um, Natalie, knowing that we all can be affected with breast cancer and having a close friend affected with breast cancer, how did that change your perspective? I think any of us that know Yana, and, and she and Alan kind of alluded to the fact that they exercise, and, um, and Yana eats all the right things. Uh, the two of us couldn't be more different. I like bacon cheeseburgers, and she <laughs> likes to eat oatmeal. Um, you know, and so we, we have, you know, leading up to, to any diagnosis, we, that was something that we joked about all the time, the fact that she exercises, and she takes good care of herself, and she is a checklist kind of girl, and checks things off, and I've done this, and I've done this, and I've done this, and the fact that, you know, she... Um, knowing that she did, you know, monthly self-breast exams, and so she knew what her normal was. Um, I didn't do that before. And I think um, that, that that has been an eye-opening thing for me, um, the fact that Yana is so young, um, that she does everything right, and, and if anybody on this stage shouldn't have to have gone through breast cancer or wouldn't have been, quote-unquote, the candidate that you would think would have to face something like that, it wouldn't be Yana. And... Um, and the fact that breast cancer and cancer in general affects all of us. And um, unfortunately, um, unfortunately, it does affect us. Mm -hmm. And um, we can think of people in our lives who've been touched by, and you don't want it to be your close friend. You don't want it to be a family member. Um, but knowing that it can affect all of us and raising the awareness, um, not just within our campus, but um, the, the Facebook community, um, you know, Angela alluded to that fact. You know, I, I just know from reading Yana's blog and, and her Facebook post that people, students who graduated five years ago, ten years ago, that went to school with Yana and Alan or were students of hers that have graduated that no longer live anywhere close to Northwestern State University, but it's raised an awareness in terms of um, making sure that you are checking yourself, that you're making sure that you know, what's normal for you, and, and also the fact that it doesn't just affect women, that it's, uh, that breast cancer can affect men as well, and sometimes that's a misnomer, that, that breast cancer only happens to females, it doesn't, and um, the fact that it's raised the awareness and certainly gotten me to do, um, check myself and make sure that what's normal for me mm -hmm. is the same from month to month. Well, and, and, and to me, for, thank you for that because it, it was one of those things where um, I want students and I want friends and I want um, colleagues to know what's happening and with themselves. Um, so when the Student Activities Board approached me, when you guys approached to, to do something like this, of course I was like, that's so Sure. So you know what I mean? It was like that slight, oh no, but then no, this is important. Um, and disclosing information about what I've gone through is something that is that education part of it because young women are affected. Um, men as well, as Natalie said, but it's important that we know what our bodies are and what our bodies are telling us. Um, I was fortunate enough that my, my two-year-old at the time helped me with that. Um, so I consider myself very lucky. But eating healthy, making good lifestyle choices, um, knowing that um, what your risks are to begin with, like finding out from that history, uh, if you do have it in your family, because that increased your risk. Those are the things that you know is important for me to tell young women today that you, know, you need to not feel self-conscious about doing self breast exams or you know, not feeling self-conscious that if you if you, you you have something that might not be normal um, do I ask do I tell my health care provider or do I not like no you are your best advocate you need to stand up for what you really think is the right or the wrong thing and you need to ask those questions I have learned through this entire process that 
I have to ask questions. If I don't ask these questions, no one else is going to do it for me. Alan does a great job and all my friends and family are, you know, whenever I would speak on behalf of like what's, what I've been doing, they would have questions as well. Well, you don't know that I sure enough went to my doctor every time that I had a meeting with him and I had my checklist of questions of like, okay, questions you for this. Binder. You yeah, had a binder. Yeah, I have a binder. I have a, it was a one inch binder, now it's turned into a three inch binder of everything. I mean, I keep everything on record because you don't know, and, and that's the fear of the unknown, but you don't know unless you ask questions. And if you see a spot that's not normal, if you are discharging and it's not normal, if it's cracking, if it's bubbling, whatever it may be on your breast, um, from all the way underneath your armpit, all the way around, you just need to know as what it is. Um, and that's where you have to go and, and go talk to your healthcare provider and really kind of ask those questions. Go and see them. Um, I know, get checked if you're in your 20s, get checked every three years by healthcare providers.